So you always get an x-intercept and a y-intercept for a cubic. And that's why now we're going to focus on what happens when you've not got not just one, but you can actually get a whole bunch. Okay, so here's the graph we're going to now look at. This is number three. Okay, now I'm giving this graph to you, or rather I'm giving this equation to you in a nice, neat, factorized form. Later on, you will get um, you know, messy ones that are not factorized, and part of your work will be to factorize them, right? But at the moment, we're really only familiar with factorizing quadratics like this. We know the rules of this. If I gave you a cubic that was in this expanded form, you'd be like, where do I begin, right? Desmos, help me please, right? So at the moment, at the moment, I'm going to give you sort of the ready-made version where everything is already factorized and nice and neat for you, okay? So, just like before, I'm going to start with this most basic piece of information. I'm going to start looking for intercepts because once I've got those, I'm like, ooh, these are like anchor points. I know I go through them and then I can try and fit everything together, okay? So, which intercepts would you like to begin with, X or Y? You want to begin with the Y intercept, okay? That's a no y intercepts are generally easy to find because this is all you have to do. Right? Just go x equals zero, bam, you get a number out. Okay? So, Saran, before I take your question, I'm going to take this suggestion first and we'll run with it. Okay? So when x equals zero, what's y going to equal? Six. Six. We've been... Hold, hold your thoughts for a second. Hold your thoughts for a second. We've got a lot of ideas coming out here, right? If I was feeling mean to you this morning, I'd make you vote. But I'm not, okay? Because... I've been modeling for you how you don't need to guess, right? You don't need to guess, right? We find it by doing the substitution, right? Now, if you are, if you are good enough, if you're good enough, you'll be able to do the substitution in your head. But we evidently are not. So I'm going to write the substitution. Y equals 0 times 0 minus 2 times 0 plus 3, right? Last I checked, that was negative 2. Last I checked, that was 3. But this guy here just stays zero, right? So what's the whole thing equal to? Zero. It's zero, thank you very much. Okay? Zero multiplied by anything gives you zero. Okay? So what does this tell us about our graph? Yeah, Rasson. Uh, no, oh yeah, go ahead. Uh, can we just factorize that um, the whole equation of during change to x cubed minus six x? Okay, so the question was, can we factorize this object here and change it? The first thing I should say is it's factorized right now. That, that's the factorized form. What you're asking is, could I expand it out? And you can expand it out if you want. Um, the question is, is that a useful thing to do? At least at this moment, uh, I think we've kind of gotten to the answer that we wanted without having to expand it. Okay? Um, but I will come to expanding in a minute. Okay? I want to ask this. Yeah, okay, good. We've got coordinates out of this. I've got an x and a y. So this is 0, 0, isn't it? So I'm going to put it on there. Okay? Now, in the very first graph we did this morning, we were like, cool, I've got an x-intercept and a y-intercept all together, right? And then like, that's it, I don't need to find y-intercepts anymore. But cubics and other polynomials turn out to have sort of more, more sort of features, that's why we're focusing them on them as different things. This is the y-intercept. How do I find the x-intercept? Yeah, Shebavi. Okay, so... If I let the x's equal to zero, right? If I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take your idea because you, I think you know what you're trying to say, but don't have the language yet to say it, right? If I let x equal zero, this is what happens. Yeah, I get this, right? But I want to do something a bit different, right? I want to let y equal zero. Now, if I do that, when y equals zero, right? You can go ahead and write this with me, okay? This then gets to what Shea was talking about. Because if I have zero over here on the left-hand side, Right? This is saying, hey, I've got three things, they're multiplied together, and when you do that, you should get zero at the end. Right? Well, if you multiply three objects together and you, your answer is zero, at least one of those objects had to be zero. Right? If you took any three, bless you, non-zero objects, right? like say 2 and 15 and negative 1, right? no matter what those objects are, if none of them is zero, you won't get zero as the answer, right? One of them has to be zero. Okay? So I'm actually going to look at, and this is what Shane Balvey was talking about. I'm going to look at each one individually, right? So this guy here, x could be zero. 
right? We kind of already knew that. Did you notice that? We already knew that. What about this? If I put in x equals 2, okay, now just pause for a minute. This is a really important moment for you to focus, okay? If I put in x equals 2, these two objects here, what would they be? If x were equal to 2, what would this be? Two. That would be 2, what would this be? 2, 5, 1. So this whole object, sorry, I should have said that. Five. This whole object is 5, right? 2 and 5, but I don't care what value they take on, whether they're 2 or 5 or 5 million, because this guy in the middle, that will be 0. So then the whole thing will become 0. Are you okay with that? So x equals 2, even though it like doesn't make these things 0, it makes this one 0, so I will get 0 on the left-hand side as well. Okay? Are you, yeah, you with me? Okay, Sean. Sir, but in the, when we sub the value of x as 0, we ended up getting the value of y as 0. That's right. That's right. Yeah. But was that really necessary? Okay, so this step here, I'm including it for the sake of completeness. It doesn't just disappear, right? But then I notice, oh, I've already accounted for this earlier on. Okay, I'm going to give you another example in a second where that doesn't happen. Okay, but for this case, I want to give you a nice easy one. X equals 2 makes this one 0, so the whole thing will become 0. What's the last value of X that I could put into here? Negative 3. Negative 3. X equals negative 3. If I put this in, right, these things will not be 0. But this one will be. It'll become negative 3 plus 3, which is 0. So the whole line will become 0 oh, times some other stuff. Right, yeah, because that's what, I, that's what I started with, right? When y equals 0, that's how I find my x intercepts. Okay. So, what a lovely question. Which, which x intercept are we going to take? Do you remember when we had a look at quadratic equations, right? You would launch into the quadratic formula, perhaps, or you'd factorize, and then you might get two answers out. Which one, when you're graphing, which one do you take? You kind of need both of them because you will, you're going to take your parabola, it's going to hit your axes twice, right? What does this tell you? How many times is the cubic going to hit the axes? It's going to hit three times, here, here, and here, okay? So I'm going to put those three spots onto my graph, okay? So here's the y equation, sorry, axis, here's the x-axis. I'm going to put these guys on, right? That's going to look like two. I go through there and then one, two, three. Okay, so you can see I've got these crosses where I know I'm going to go through. That's zero. Now, this is a bit weird. What's the shape that goes through all of these? Um, yeah, it's going to have to kind of weave up and down through this shape. Okay? Now, don't draw this, okay? but I'm going to put a question to you. If I go through these three points, right, there are two ways that I could go through this. Two ways. I could go through like this, or just as equally, couldn't I also go through those three points like this? <coughs> Don't they both, they both, my orange and my green, both go through all three points. Do you agree with that? So we have right. one negative point there, so then it would go, positive goes up. It's something to do with the sign. Hmm, it is something to do with the sign. These guys are the positive and negative versions of each other. My question is, how would I work out which one it is? I've got a tool at my disposal, I've already used it today. What could I possibly do? Yeah. I could put more values in. I could substitute in a point and then see where it ends up. Okay? So I'm not going to put in x equals 0 because I already know where that goes. I'm not going to put x equals 2. I'm not going to put x equals negative 3. I already know what happens to all of those. Can someone suggest to me another point? How about 1? That's a nice, neat, easy number. right? So if I put x equals 1 into this, I should write this down. When x equals 1, okay, let's see what happens. I'm going to get y equals 1 times 1 minus 2 times 1 plus 3. It's just a straight substitution. I haven't done any calculating at all. I've literally just put all the numbers in at the right spot. right? Okay? I know what 1 is. That's fine. What about 1 minus 2? That's negative 1. And then on the end there, I've got 1 plus 3, which is 4. So my final answer will be negative 4. So when x equals 1, um, the coordinates I get out of this are 1 comma negative 4. Where is that? The answer is, well, it's not going to be up here. It's going to be down here, isn't it? Right? So I could put that in somewhere like this. Like so. 